my dad was really from another time. He was born in 1918, just around the time of the First World War. And his father, if I remember correctly, was born about 1890. And my dad revered his father. Him and his father were extremely close. It's almost as like in some ways they lived vicariously through each other. So as a result, dad, even though he lived up until 1998, his mind was of a different century, of a different time, of a time when they told stories. Stories were much more of a communication method. They, he came from a time where there was no television, there was no radio, there was no obviously no internet, and not even any lighting in the houses perhaps, so they would entertain each other by telling stories. He was a fabulous storyteller. He was also not politically correct at all. There was back then there was there was no such thing. You just said things that were of the time. And at times, in today's standards, he would be seen as kind of crude at times. He was a working man and he liked to fart, for example. And mom sometimes would give him give him heck for that. And dad would say things like, well, you know. A farting horse will never tire. A farting man is the man to hire. <laughs> and he, that was an old saying that he had. And he had other sayings. One other one I remember he had was pig in a poke. He also had a saying that for us, for us boys, if we were having a challenge with a job or whatever, he'd say, heck, even a woman could do that. Which today would be kind of a little bit dicey, right? But at the time, that's the way men talked. I remember us kids back in the 70s, we didn't have, he was also very much a conservative, so he didn't allow us to have television, even when television was out. We weren't even allowed to have radio in the house. But he would tell us stories and we'd tell stories. Before he went, he'd go to bed early, because he was, a, he was we had a farm, he would like to get up early. And a lot of times if he had a headache or whatever, he'd take a shot of brandy. He had a big bottle of brandy, he'd take a half a glass of it, shoot it back. And then before going to bed, he'd tell a story. <laughs> and I remember, and often the stories had meaning to them. And this one, I always remember, because it has a lot of meaning to it. He told us a story of how there was a, there was a guy who worked for a bishop in a, a church that was called St. Paul's. And the man's job was that of the verger. And as he described, the verger was the guy, the head caretaker of the property. The church, church properties were very big. They had a lot of grounds, gardens, a lot of ornate windows and so on that had to be maintained. So the verger was the one who maintained them. And at the time, in England, there was a caste system and you could work your way up through that caste a little bit. And this man who was the verger passed away one day unexpectedly. And he was a very good, very good worker. So the bishop was a little bit distraught. What was he going to do? He had to make sure that his church looked the best it could. So he brought the next man who had worked there for 20 years, who was also a very good worker, who worked underneath the verger, called him into his office and he said, sir, I want you to be the verger. And of course the bishop knew this was a very good job. This was a high paying job. This was a respected job in the community. If you could work directly for the bishop, that was the high job of the time. The bishop said, sir, all you have to do, as he dipped his feather pen into the ink, is sign here, and now you are the burger of St. Paul's. And the man said, your, excell your excellen excellency, bishop, most illustrious bishop, there's the term, I cannot sign that. And the bishop said, sure you can. There's a, this is a good job. This will put your family in good stead. This will put you in a great standing in the community. So, and a wonderful job for you. And he said, no, you don't understand. He says, I cannot write. And the bishop said, you cannot write? How can that be? You worked here for 20 years. And the requirement when you work for the bishop is that you, that you can write. He said, unfortunately, you can't be the burger. Furthermore, you can't even work for the bishop anymore. I'm sorry to tell you, I'm going to have to lay you off. You have to go. Because that's a requirement, you have to be able to write. 
The poor man was very much let down. He had worked the only job there, the only job he'd ever worked for 20 years. He had a wife and children at home that depended on him. And furthermore, there weren't a lot of jobs of that quality in the area. But he set out home on his way in several miles to walk. He didn't smoke very much, but only when he was under a lot of stress and he had to figure out a problem. So on this day, he decided, I want to get some tobacco to smoke. And as he walked along home, he couldn't find any tobacconists. Where are the tobacconists? And then he remembered all of his co-workers at the diocese were telling him all, they were always complaining that they had to walk way to the other side of the city to get their tobacco. He, couldn't, he didn't want to walk all the way to the other side of the city, but he had to because he realized the only way he could get something meaningful to tell to his wife was if he had a smoke and clear up his mind. Off he went across the other side of the city got his smokes, and on his way back, he was smoking away, and he almost ran into a gentleman on the sidewalk. And the gentleman at the time was setting up a sign that said, shop for let. So he asked the guy, how much? 10 quid a month, the gentleman said. So the man said, I'll take it right now. The shopkeeper was surprised because that quick he decided but you see, he was halfway through his cigarette, and he figured out that there was no other tobacconists in the area. So he had to be it. And when he got home, his wife, with a big smile, how was your day? The gentleman said, I am now the tobacconist of this area. I'm no longer employed by the bishop. She couldn't understand. She was, But he was so excited about his, his change that even her... Her down thoughts couldn't get to him. In the days and weeks and months to follow, more and more of the local gentlemen filed into his shop. And every day his biggest problem was carrying the money bags to the bank. And within about a year, the banker finally made a stop for his tobacco. The banker told him, you have to come down to the bank. I've got something to tell you. So he made an appointment for the next week. The gentleman went down and met the banker. The banker sat down with him and he said, you know, you've amassed a small fortune in your bank account and you've got it in a low interest bearing account. I'm going to offer you a higher interest bearing account so you can take advantage of all this money you have. All you have to do is sign here and it'll all be taken care of. And the gentleman said, I can't do that. The banker said, surely you can. You can take advantage of a higher interest rate. The gentleman said, no, I can't write. And the banker looked at him and he said, you mean to say that you've amassed this fortune in the bank account and you can't write? What could you have done if you could write? And the gentleman sat back in his seat and said, I would have been the burger of St. Paul's. Thank <laughs> you.